Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bacon and Shaken with Washington Red Raspberries. We're honored to partner with the Washington Red Raspberry Commission on this class series uh, to demonstrate various applications of frozen red raspberry formats for industry professionals like you and like us. So, um, my name is Zach Miller. I'm the Baking and Pastry Arts instructor here at the New Orleans Culinary and Hospitality Institute, which is a mouthful. <laughs> so we go with Noki for short, with the hard K sound. So uh, everybody says Nochi though, so don't feel bad if you, if you said it that way, it's not a problem. Uh, I'm very fortunate to be joined today um, by Chef Jeremy Fogg of oh. Emeralds and many other things that you can probably tell us about. You've got a lot of, he does a lot of different things. So uh, he'll tell us about that as we get into the class. And today, our, our, speaking of the class, our subject today is going to be focusing on chocolates and confections. So we're going to do some uh, chocolate uh, bonbons, different things like that for you guys today. Uh, pretty excited about what we're going to be making today. But uh, before we get started, let's take a look at the story behind Washington Red Raspberries, which make up about 90% of the nation's frozen red raspberry crop. My dad started this farm in 77. We grew up running around in the berry fields and the raspberries run deep in our veins. You just have to deal with what Mother Nature gives you every year, and every year is different. I'm passionate about doing the best job that we can to get a prime berry to share with the world. We're talking about some of the, the products that you received uh, in the mail and some of the products that we'll be using today. Um, in the front, actually, my, to my left, probably to your right, I'm not really sure if I mirrored by camera or not, but you've got the whole uh, IQF raspberries, which uh, you can see are really, actually really nice. They're starting to frost a little bit right now, so they're actually looking really pretty. I don't know if I can zoom, we can't zoom in on them or not on, on Zoom. Zoom doesn't have a zoom feature. Hmm. Not that I'm aware of anyway, but we should need to talk to them about that. It's a marketing ploy. Uh, we have our um, whole and broken uh, IQF. We've got our um, dehydrated powder. We have our dehydrated fragments, which are here. Um, we also have our uh, frozen puree, this is our, our seedless puree. This is really one we're gonna be using today, exclusively, mm -hmm. some of our future classes, we'll be playing around with some of the other things. Actually, I take that back, because we're gonna be using some of the, uh, some of the powder as well. Yeah. So, um, so we're gonna have some fun with uh, these guys right here. And um, it's really kind of interesting, we were, we were talking about this, how the puree especially, because that's the one we, we, were, um, we ended up planning on using today. We were talking about it earlier, how different it is. It's really very intensely flavored. Uh, and it doesn't have any sugar in it too, which is kind of which you said, you really, really like that idea of that. Yeah, so, because if you're gonna be using this puree in other recipes, you don't have to worry about accounting for that sugar content that's in the puree. You can just add the sugar. Um, it doesn't affect that, so. Yeah. It's a control thing, I think, that we like as, as, yeah. as chefs. So. <laughs> Um, with that, so it's, it's really, uh, you know, we'll talk more about the flavor profiles and uses of these as we go through and kind of as we're, we're talking about um, our products as we go through. So we'll actually, we're going to pan over to uh, Chef Jeremy, um, uh, which I'm, um, we did do the introduction, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we're going to pan over to Chef Jeremy and he's going to talk about um, starting us off with uh, his product. Yep. Okay. So the first thing um, I'm going to make today, there's two things finished product wise that we're making. We're gonna make two different types of bonbons. One that's gonna be in a polycarbonate mold, a molded bonbon, which is pretty traditional. And then the other one is kind of a, a new fun thing that I saw on social media and we're gonna give it a try today. Um, but the first component for the first bonbon, what we're making um, is going to be a raspberry and ruby bonbon. I'm using the ruby chocolate from Calibo. Um, I'm also an abra brand, huh. I'm a brand ambassador for Calibo chocolate and this ruby chocolate is really, really fun. I won't get into it because I know the point of this um, session is for the raspberries, but the flavor profile of this naturally pink chocolate pairs really well with red fruits like raspberry. So I figured it'd be perfect um, for this demo. So the first thing I'm making is the ruby and raspberry ganache. Um, we're using raspberry puree, um, heavy cream, some butter, and then the ruby chocolate. Uh, the one thing I did before I got this in the pot, that raspberry puree tends to separate as it thaws out. So I just used an immersion blender to blend it back together uh, before I went ahead and used it in the recipe. 
And so on the stove here is the raspberry puree with the heavy cream and a little bit of salt. And so once it has come up in temperature, just like making any other type of ganache, you're just going to take that heated cream and raspberry mixture, melt your chocolate, and you need to work quickly because the ratio of chocolate to the liquid tends to cool it down pretty quick. So a lot of times what I do is let it get mostly melted. I'll add in the butter. And then I'm gonna use the immersion blender to bring this together before it cools too much. Okay, great. I just heard that somebody is excited about the ruby. So I'm, I'm glad you can see us working with that. Okay, we're almost there. There we go. So once that's ready, um, you could potentially use this right away if it's not too warm or if you want to let it cool a little bit, but you just want to make sure it's nice and emulsified. I have some ganache that's already ready. Uh, so the ruby, it's being touted as like the fourth type of chocolate. <clears throat> Um, because the process by which it's made retains this natural pink color that certain cocoa beans um, have. And so it doesn't turn brown in the process of creating it into what we know of as chocolate to use, that whole bean to bar process. Um, so it can be a little tricky to work with because it's temperature and pH sensitive. So the best way to work with it is in its natural form. So by tempering it to use for bonbon shells um, or as chocolate garnish, if you're using it for ganaches and whatnot, you have to be careful which ingredients you're using um, because when the pH level drops to a certain percentage, it, that pink hue will kind of go away and it turns into more of a mauve sort of color. Um, so using the raspberry puree with this, you saw how nice that ganache color is. It stays almost kind of like a mixture of the two, so it's still got a pretty vibrant color. Um, but the great thing is this chocolate has much more of a tropical flavor and less of what we think of as a chocolate flavor. Um, and the mouthfeel is a lot like white chocolate if you haven't had it. Uh, but it's got a little bit of a tanginess and it's definitely got a lot of fruity notes and it goes very well with tropical fruits and red fruits. Uh, but there's a million different ways you can use it too. Um, it's, it's pretty, pretty cool. The shelf life for the ganache, um, probably only about a week. I wouldn't let it go. What I do when I make it is I'll actually make it and whatever I don't use, I'll put in the cooler to hold it longer and then just let it come up to temper. And if it does separate, this ganache has a tendency to lose that emulsion. Um, you can just rewarm it and re-blend it and it'll come back together. I've had success with that. Um, so I've already got our first layer. Um, I have our mold lined with our chocolate and then I have our ganache here that's ready. So chef, once these are, are capped and sealed inside of the bonbon shell, how long would you say your ganache was going to be going to um, last? That is a good question. I haven't actually had any long enough to know <laughs> what that shelf life inside the bonbon would be because um, typically we have them within a couple of days of making them. So um, I don't want to give an incorrect answer but I would say you should be good for at least a week. Um, and if you freeze your bonbons, I don't know if people do that, um, but if you were to freeze them, obviously they would last for much longer. Um, so we're just gonna use our ganache to fill, overfilling those, oops.
Okay. All right. So I already know that some of these are a little overfilled, um, which is a mistake on my part. But hey, mistakes happen, right? So we're just going to use this. And then we'll go ahead and do the rest of our chocolate to do our final layer. Actually, I kind of need to warm this again before I work with it. Um, so while I do that, do you want to go into your pad to flee? Sure. Um, Absolutely. And I'll get these finished off camera because I think we all have made bonbons before. So. <laughs> <laughs> we just did them in class not long ago. I think that's good there, Patrick. Okay. Thank you. All right, so um, I'm going to make, I'm called uh, it's a PB and J, peanut butter and jelly. So what we're going to start off with, uh, and we're going to do, when we cut this, it's going to be an enrobed candy and an enrobed bonbon. So I'm going to start off with a layer of pat de fouille, which is actually going to be the top. So I'm going to, that's going to go down first. Then I'm going to make a peanut uh, gianduja. So, you know, peanut butter and jelly. I think we think of what to do with confections with raspberry. That's kind of towards the top of the list. So I have uh, a frame over here that's an, a nine by nine inch frame. I've got it set on uh, a nonstick mat. And then I've got in my pot here, the raspberry puree. And I was actually thinking about, it. this is the seedless raspberry puree. I was actually thinking about it today. If you got a hold of the seeded, I think it would be kind of interesting to have that because I kind of like the texture of seeds in the raspberry. Kind of gives you like, hey, I'm, I'm really eating a raspberry. Or even doing half puree, half of the whole and broken would be kind of an interesting thing in there because you get some of the tech, a little bit more texture in there uh, from those things. So let me get my whisk here. And it's going to be kind of hard to see in, in my little pot here. But um, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to switch to my whisk for right now. In here, I have a small amount of sugar. Uh, the measurement is in your packet that you'll see and my pectin. And I'm using a, a, pat, to, a pat de fouille pectin which is uh, an HM pectin, I believe. So it's designed for uh, the pat de fouille to make the jellies. So I've got my heat on here. I'm gonna add this in the beginning because we want time for that, that pectin to dissolve. And it's really important to mix it thoroughly with the sugar first, if you've not worked with it before. And the way I tell my students, it's like working with uh, like making a roux or doing anything like that because well, everybody in New Orleans knows what roux is and how to make a roux. Uh, if you just throw a handful of flour into a gravy or a stock to make a, to make a gravy, it's going to be lumpy. So you need to disperse it in something. Uh, same kind of idea, it's something that's meant to thicken something. So you're dispersing it in the sugar. So this is going to heat up. We're going to bring this to a boil. Then I've got um, some different sugars here. I've got trimline and I've got glucose syrup. Uh, trimline, uh, also known as invert sugar. I guess it's kind of like Kleenex, the brand with that. So you could substitute corn syrup for the glucose syrup if you wanted to. They're really basically the same kind of thing. So now, as this comes up to a boil, which it is now, I'm actually going to turn it off just for a second while I incorporate my other sugars. So trimline. And these are going to be helpful for uh, texture, for preservation, um, th things like that. That's why we're using some of these alternative sugars in here. Uh, glucose syrup. And it is very sticky stuff. I don't know if that's showing up on camera, but if you've never worked with it before, I'm sure you all have. Uh, it can be quite sticky. But my favorite, um, actually, uh, one of the favorite pranks I've seen, I did not do this, was that they, um, and this is back when, you know, every, your shops had phones and stuff like that. So somebody put glucose over the earpiece of a, of a phone and told, you know, their coworker, hey, you've got a phone call. They put it up to the ear, and then you could just see all the strands of glucose syrup coming off of it. So, <laughs> little side story. <laughs> now you're all going to want to go do that. So, so that's going to come up to a boil again. Then I'm going to add my sugar.
And really kind of talking about this puree versus others, I really find this, I mean, the aroma, the aroma, the, the aroma of, of the raspberry, is re it's really very, uh, very intense. It's really got a, a really wonderful uh, aroma to it, really great kind of true flavor to it. I'm going to switch over to my thermometer now. So I'm going to stir this. I don't want this to scorch. This, does, this is going to get thick. And I'm going to get my thermometer. I'm going to cook this to 106 degrees Celsius. Make sure my thermometer is in Celsius. And I'm going to stir this. And hopefully not get it on my white apron. And FYI, Chef, these burners are a little strong, so you want to be cautious. Heard that. So slowly working our way up. At this point, we're just, we're just removing water. So I'm sure some of you may have made a uh, pat de before. This is my favorite uh, formula for it. It's pretty universal. Uh, it works well with uh, a lot of different uh, purees, but obviously we want to think about the raspberry today. So I'm going to turn it down just a little bit more because that's really going to town. I don't want it to, to scorch. So I'm so 105 roughly. And sometimes with a small amount, what I like to do is I'll tilt my, my pan and I get a deeper reading from my thermometer. That does help sometimes if you're cooking a small amount, which in, uh, in the school we'll do small amounts. We're not really, we're not focused on how much we can make. We're focused on, you know, quality and the skill level involved. So uh, just, you kind of learn some tricks to making things on smaller levels. So I'm looking at, and this will jump around a little bit just because it is so thick at this point. Amy, can you smell that out in the hall already? <laughs> so we're just about there. It does take a little time to get up to that temperature, especially with a thicker puree. But the nice thing about this, we're going to enrobe this in chocolate today, uh, or dip it because we're going to do it by hand. Uh, but it is, it is going to be shelf stable. Pat Defui and the Giandu are both shelf stable without uh, heating, sorry, without coating, uh, coating them with chocolate. So uh, unlike the ganache that um, Chef Jeremy made, which needs to, be, needs to be sealed up inside of the bonbon, or it will, it will go bad at room temperature. These are, these are stable at room temperature. So now I've got, I've reached that temperature. I'm gonna add my citric acid. And the citric acid is gonna really help with its setting. Um, you know, I use citric acid for it. Some older recipes will use lemon juice. They'll use um, vinegar. I've even seen that in some of them. So I'm gonna stir that in. It just helps, it, helps the pectin set in in an acidic environment. So that's going to go into my, my frame. I'm going to spread that out, encourage it out to the edges. And I want to try and get this to set nice and level. So I just want to make sure I go right to my corners so I get a good yield out of this. And we're going to let this do its thing for a few minutes. Make sure I get that all in there. And then I'm just going to give it a little tap. And I've got my spatula here just to kind of work out that lump so it stays nice and even. This should uh, self-level pretty well. And the more I'm going to, I'm tempted to mess around with it, but the more I mess around with it at this point, um, the worse it's going to be. So at some point you want to make sure, you know, just let it level 
and set. And there we go. So that's the uh, first round. Now, you can do this. You can have this on its own, uh, Raspberry Pi uh cut it, and you know, just have it as a, uh, as a petty four, uh, do a lot of different things uh, with it. Uh, I've done something with it which would be kind of interesting is you spread it very, very thin on a silt pat or nonstick mat, and then you top it with a layer of marshmallow. And you can flavor the marshmallow however you want. Um, and then what you do is you do like a pinwheel effect. You kind of cut it, spiral it up, and serve it like a lollipop. So it's actually kind of a fun thing uh, to do. I did one, uh, an ambrosia version of it. <laughs> so I did, uh, what's, I did a, was it pineapple and orange? Pactifui, and I did like a coconut flavored marshmallow, so it was like ambrosia salad. And I dipped, I had a little powdered yogurt, and I kind of dipped it, so it kind of gives it that acidity mm -hmm. from like the sour cream that you'd get. So, uh, kind of a fun thing uh, to play around with. So, um, I think we're, um, what are we working on next? Is it I me? Think, I, th I think you're going to get your Janduya started, ah, and then we'll that is correct. come back over. So, you're stuck with me again for a little while. So the, the, the Jean Duya, I'm going to grab my machine over here. Let me try and go around the back. If you've not made one before, uh, Jean Du is really, it's, it's just really like a, uh, a fancy Nutella, if you've never heard of it before. So what we're going to start off with are basically uh, any nut that you choose. It should be kind of an oilier uh, one if you don't have, uh, usually it's, it's traditionally done with hazelnuts, but you can use almonds, almonds and hazelnuts. In this case, I'm going to use, I'm going to use peanuts. So I'll start off with peanuts and about half of my sugar. And that's going to go in here. And that's just going to run until all the oils start to come out. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of a brief overview of this. And I'm going to move this out of the way because it's going to get kind of loud. And we'll go back over to, uh, to Chef Jeremy in a moment. But I'm going to get this going. Um, but it's going to be a little bit loud, especially in the beginning. Told you. So we're going to let this run until the oils come out, forms a nice smooth paste, almost like peanut butter. We're going to add this, and we're also going to add our, our melted milk chocolate to it. Uh, and then as this runs and this does its thing, it's just going to take a little bit of time. So you guys have probably all seen a food processor run. It's not very exciting. So we're going to let this run. I'm going to pull this back onto the back table for a little while just to let it run. Uh, after the oils have come out, I'm going to add the melted milk chocolate to it. I'm going to bring it back here, and we're going to table it to temper it. And we're going to top our raspberry pat de with our peanut butter gianduya. So, and we'll have a little peanut butter and jelly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to turn this off and get this further away from the microphone, and we'll turn you over to Chef Jeremy. Okay, welcome back, everyone. Um, so, I went ahead while Chef Zach was working on those projects, I capped off those bonbons and their setting, and we'll unmold those at the end of the class. Um, the next bonbon that we're working on, um, maybe you've seen how they've done them on social media. That's how I saw it, and I was like, ooh, that looks really fun. I'm going to give this a try. Um, it's instead of, so we all know a bonbon is essentially a filling that's inside of chocolate. Um, we're mostly used to those either being something that's dipped or something that's done in a mold. And so this method that I saw, uh, which we'll get into a little bit later, but you use transfer sheets and a ring cutter and you kind of make it in there, these very thin wafer type bonbons. They're a little bit different, they're pretty unique and they're pretty fun. So what I wanted to do for a filling for that, it seems like you need to f use a filling that's a little bit more liquid or a little bit softer so that it will, you can mold it better without it running everywhere but without it being so solid that the chocolate, that it won't, uh, that it's not malleable enough to be a proper filling for that bonbon. So I figured a jam would be perfect, and plus that's a great way to use this raspberry puree to have a nice, like, strong flavor. Um, so what I've got here, we're gonna, this is a jam that's gonna be set with pectin, but it's not got as high of a ratio because I want it to be a little bit more soft set um, for the purpose of filling that bonbon. Um, so I have the raspberry puree and some lemon juice over here, and same thing that I did with the, um, 
that I did with the ganache, I had blended the puree first. Um, but for the purposes of the jam, if you're using the entire container, you could probably just throw that right in and it'll blend itself as you're making the jam. Um, but I didn't use the full container, so I blended it ahead of time. So I had the same ratio of that pulp to the juice, like so everything was, would stay the way that it should. Um, so I've just brought that puree and lemon juice up to a boil. And then here I've mixed my pectin into my sugar, same principle behind uh, why Zach did that with the pat de fouille. Um, you want to mix the pectin in. This is a slow set pectin, so it's a different type than what he used for his pat de fouille. Um, but all we're going to do this is put that right in. And then I like to use a rubber spatula when I'm making jam because then I can make sure I'm um, scraping the bottom and the sides and not get any parts that are scorching or that haven't mixed together properly. Um, and then this recipe is pretty straightforward. We're just going to mix it all together and we want this to come up to a boil and we're just going to let it boil for one minute to activate that pectin and that'll be that. So I've got this in here. Let's see how quickly that power, I'm going to turn it up so hopefully I don't <laughs> hurt myself in doing that. Um, and then to get this to cool a little bit quicker, since we're not going to be jarring it, we're going to be using it for the bonbon filling, um, I'm just going to spread it out on the sheet tray so that it can start to set. Uh, but I do already have some jam that's finished as well, so we can make those bonbons um, a little bit later. Uh, it looks like this is going to take a little bit to come up, so um, I'll go ahead and talk about that process for that bonbon a little bit more right now while we wait for this. So what we're going to use is um, transfer sheets. Oh. So, I mean, you probably can't really see it because it's clear, but we're going to use the transfer sheet and I'm actually going to cut this down into strips to make it easier to work with. But we're going to take our tempered chocolate and pipe discs onto um, half of the transfer sheet. And then we're going to take the other half and lay it on top before the chocolate sets to kind of press it out. Um, to give us that more of a disc shape. Then we're going to peel that open and you're going to have your soft tempered chocolate on either side. Then we'll use um, a piping bag to put our jam just on the center of it and put that other layer back on top and press around to reseal those two layers of chocolate. And we're just going to use a ring cutter to punch out to get a cleaner edge around that. And so since we're using a transfer sheet, you can put cocoa butter down or use a transfer sheet that has a pattern on it. It'll all work exactly the same. Um, but what's going to end up happening is you'll have this very nice, like thin, uh, flat kind of wafer almost. And so you get that little bit of jam in the center with that tempered chocolate. And it's going to taste really great. Um, and look, that was perfect timing because our jam has started to boil. Well, it started to simmer. So we'll give this, um, give this some time to come back up. I'm going to turn it up a little bit because I'm impatient at times. <laughs> um, yeah, I've seen the, this method for the bonbons done where they used, it looked like hazelnut paste and it almost looked like your pure praline paste, that, the one-to-one. -one. Um, that they put in there, but I imagine you could use a ganache, you can use a jam, you can use anything that's going to be a little bit, like I said, softer and more malleable for the filling. And it's kind of nice because then when you bite into it, especially if it's room temperature, that filling is kind of like runny rather than like a solid ganache. So it's a pretty cool kind of mouthfeel. All right, we are up to a boil, so I'm just going to keep an eye on this time. Um, I don't really have any kind of filler commentary at this point, and I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, Chef, tell us about uh, some of the things you do at the restaurant. Okay, there we go. That's a good filler. Um, yeah, so a little bit about me. I'm the pastry chef for Emerald's Restaurants, um, but the restaurant is currently closed due to the pandemic. Um, they're figuring out what our next course is going to be. Uh, but in the meantime, I've been doing demos and stuff like this. Um, but types of desserts that we've done at the restaurant, you know, our signature one's a banana cream pie, but I like to do things that are a little bit more fashion forward, but still kind of rooted in sort of things that are comfortable and familiar. So like instead of a pecan pie, it might be a pecan tart or even like an entremet that has more layers to it. So it's taking something that's a little more traditional and, and doing a little bit more with it, kind of refining it some. 
Um, and we are at our one minute. So we'll take this off of here. And then we're just going to pour that in. And then we'll just let this set. Um, you can really just let this go till it sets. It doesn't have to be cold to work with. It's better if it's a little bit just like under room temperature. So think more like 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Because um, I found that if you use it when it's room, well, let me clarify, room temp in the south is like 78 to 84, <laughs> especially if your air conditioner doesn't work. Um, so when I say room temp, if it's around like that 70 to 75-ish, it's a little bit too soft to work with for the bonbon filling. Um, so you want to have it kind of around that 60 degree. So we'll pull it out of the cooler and let it temper just a sec before we finish the bonbons. Um, but that's the jam. I mean, pretty straightforward and simple. Uh, and I think Chef Zach is ready to table his jandouille. I am just about ready. Yes, I am ready. You are ready. Good. I am ready. <laughs> So uh, you can see after it spent some uh, quality time in the food processor, uh, the peanuts have basically liquefied. They've uh, released their oils, kind of turned into a puree. And if you're looking kind of like a basic uh, jandouille ratio, you're looking at about a one to one to one. So one part nuts, one part chocolate, one part uh, powdered sugar. I forgot my spatula. So you want to start off with a finer uh, grind sugar. You can use, uh, use 10x sugar. You can use the 6x sugar. That would be fine for this as well. But uh, especially in a home food processor, like not really home, this is uh, a, a restaurant grade food processor, you're not gonna be able to grind the particles of the sugar down fine enough to get a nice smooth texture. Um, the nuts, we all were able to get a nice smooth texture on this, but um, the sugar, you're just not gonna be able to, to do that. So that's why I'm leaning towards using uh, confectioner sugar in that. So good question. So we can get everything off of here. Right onto our marble. Any natural stone will do. You do not have to have Carrera marble for this to work. <laughs> you can use quartz, you can use um, granite, anything like that. And you go right on the surface. So uh, if you do not have one, you, you can use stainless steel, but uh, it's going to be very challenging. You'd have to probably move it around quite a bit to get it to cool. I actually have a the tip. Same. Um, so I wanted to make my own like creamed fondant for Easter one year, and so I needed marble. So I actually just went to like not a quarry, but a place that does like countertops, whatever you want to call that. Yeah, stone yard. Um, stone yard, yeah. yeah. And I asked them if they had like small pieces that I could buy. And it just happened this one place was like, oh, well, we have all this, like the sink cutouts and other mm -hmm. pieces. They're like, we just throw them away. So you can just go yeah. out there and pick one. I'll give them to you for free. Yeah. So if you really want a piece of marble or other type of stone to do this kind of work, yeah. go to one of those places and ask them for their scrap and they'll probably yeah. give it to you. Actually, one of my students, that's what he did for, uh, he's a, uh, changed careers, decided to join us here at Noki, but that's what he did uh, in for previous employment is he actually ran, in, uh, I think he owned one and owned a stone yard. So what we're doing right now with tabling is we're getting the cocoa butter to crystallize in the milk chocolate. So just because it's got, um, you know, it does have cocoa butter in it. So anything with cocoa butter, you can pretty much temper. But this is going to be nice and soft too. It does not need to be tempered. It was just melted when it went in. Uh, you can even throw in you know, small chocolate coins in there. It'll make a bit more noise, which is why I didn't do it. Uh, because the heat from the friction of um, blend, uh, breaking down the, um, the nuts um, actually in, in the food processor, that's gonna create some heat. So you can actually, if you wanted to, just throw them in just like that. Uh, so you do not need to temper chocolate because we can go ahead and temper our gianduya at this point just like this. And if you've not made your own, you know, you know, I know you can buy it and it's good, but uh, making your own is, is kind of a whole lot of fun. So, uh, and, you can, and then you can customize the flavors too. You can get a really dark roast on your 
hazelnuts if you wanted to. Uh, you can do a lighter roast on them. So you can do a lot of different things to this and kind of customize your flavors. You can use different types of nuts. Um, you can do probably a sesame one too if you wanted to. That would be kind of interesting. Or maybe you'd have to do set part sesame and part something. Possibly. Yeah. Almond's usually pretty neutral. Mm -hmm. um, sunflower seeds could be interesting. You could probably do something like that. Because really you're tempering uh, the chocolate. So. so being a nut product, you have to worry about rancidity. And we've all probably had that smell, like usually macadamia nuts, because they, they like to go rancid pretty quickly. So let me see how I'm doing here with my thermometer. <laughs> Okay, so we can see it started to thicken. I've got down to about, let me go to Fahrenheit for you. Uh, upper 70s Fahrenheit. Um, I'm gonna go just a little bit cooler. Once you see it to start to thicken, that's really what you're looking for. And we're just m manipulating it. Uh, it's not like a pr uh, praline paste. Uh, praline paste, which is really just nuts and sugar. This is the addition of chocolate. And the chocolate's gonna um, really help stabilize that product. Now, one more thing about this. We're going to enrobe this in chocolate. One thing about chocolate, chocolate is a fat system and so is the gianduja. What will eventually happen over time is it will look like your chocolate has bloomed. But what's actually happened is the fat from the nuts and everything has actually migrated into the chocolate uh, to the outside. So it's actually not, not bloom, uh, it's uh, fat migration. So if you do enrobe this, it, it, um, you will eventually see that happening after it will take um, I would say probably at least a month for that to happen roughly but uh, you will see that eventually happening on this let's see I can actually I'm starting to thicken up nicely here so we're just about there as so I know I kinda, I'm kind of jumping around I kind of like do a little dance when I table so it's just kind of I guess just one of those things that I do. So, and like I said, it's really nice to kind of customize this with, with different things as well. Now, if I wanted to, now I'm kind of thinking about it, I could put some of the, uh, the raspberry fragments right inside of this or the raspberry powder, powder to flavor it as well. Um, that would be kind of an interesting thing to do because this is a fat system. It's gonna protect those dehydrated products from uh, wanting to get soggy or something like that in humid environments, like, like we experience quite a bit here in New Orleans. <laughs> uh, every day, all year round, pretty much. I think there's maybe three days in January that it's not humid, but um, maybe three. So that tends to be a problem. So this would actually protect, protect those from uh, absorbing that. So let me bring my other contraption over here closer so I can just go from one to the next. I'm just gonna let that sit here. I'm gonna bring this just a bit closer. And you see, I did put the parchment underneath that uh, just, to, just to make it easier to slide around. I made the mistake before of leaving it right on there and it's, you can't slide off the, the, non -stick, the non stick mat, which is kind of. Right. Yeah, right? So, um, so I ended up having to put one, uh, something on top of the marble and lift the marble up and flip it over, which is. Scary. It's scary and hard. <laughs> um, and hard to do. So uh, I, um, I've learned my lesson on that. So you probably decrease it slightly, uh, but that's, you know, the one, the one to one to one or equal parts of all three is a, is a basic ratio. You can uh, manipulate that a little bit if you wanted to. I'd probably use a little bit less dark. If I was using white, I would go probably a little bit more than with the milk chocolate. So I'm just going to give this just a little bit more. This just does need to be tabled a bit to get it to where it needs to be.
and our room temperature isn't, you know, it's actually fairly cool in here today, but um, you know, depending on the temperature of your marble, your room temperature, this will go quicker, or this may take a really long time. So we're not too bad, we're, we're at 70 degrees, so it's actually pretty good. So we're just about done, I think, with this. So you can see it's starting to thicken quite a bit now. Not quite a bit, but from my, my perspective, <laughs> it has been thickening a bit here. Now, Chef, do you get to do a lot of, um, a lot of chocolate making or candy making at, uh, at Emeralds? Um, not really, because one, the time that goes into it versus our volume. Um, but also we're more doing plated desserts, so we're not doing as much like fine chocolate work like this. It's something we were starting to work on before we had to shut down. Uh, we were working on things like bonbons and mini macarons and pate de fouille and whatnot to do sort of a minier d's uh, kind of final part of the meal for a tasting menu. Uh, so unfortunately we didn't get to do more with that before we had to shut down. Um, so yet chocolate work is not something I've been able to do a lot of in my career, which is a little disappointing. Um, but that's why it's nice for me to be working with Calibo as well and doing this demo and whatnot. It gives me that opportunity to continue moving on with uh, or, and doing more like chocolate work and like, you know, fine work like this. So there? I'm going to, uh, it's almost there, but my, my pat de fouille is um, just a little bit warm yet. So I'm actually going to chill it just a little bit before I pop this in there. So I'm just going to kind of gather this here and I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, and I'll go ahead and I'm going to level this out once I get this, uh, this cooled just a little bit. So we can turn back over to you, Chef. Okay, great. Uh, where's that um, raspberry powder and the, the thing, oh, the, the, the little ramekin? We'll get that for you right away. Yeah, because I'm about to, we're about to make our bonbons. I have my raspberry jam here in this bag that's ready. Um, and I'll grab the chocolate, you know, as soon as we need. The key with these bonbons is unlike when you do other bonbons with this, you need to actually work pretty quickly so that the chocolate doesn't set before you're ready. Oh, uh, ring cutters. That's one thing I didn't grab. Um, and then so one other fun thing, aside from us having just the raspberry powder in, or excuse me, the raspberry jam inside these, I'm gonna use the raspberry powder to kind of garnish the outside of the bonbon as well. And so the way we're gonna do that is we're just going to, on one side of it, where we're gonna pipe our chocolate, we'll just dust the raspberry powder. And I mean, you could of course do um, cocoa butter, you know, like paintbrush it, splatter it, however you want to do it. Um, or you could leave it plain. Um, but I thought this raspberry powder might be a nice little touch. Um, cause it actually gives off a lot of flavor for it being a powder. Um, all right. Is the chocolate good to go? It looks a little thick. It is a little thick. I'm going to give it a little shot here with the heat gun. Okay, give us just, <laughs> I don't know if you can see him back, yeah, you can see him back there. Um, our chocolate looks like it got a little bit too thick and I would be worried in doing that, like I was saying, you have to move pretty quick. That's also why I'm not using a piece of marble underneath this um, because if it sets too fast, you won't be able to seal and cut, um, cut the bonbon shape out. So is that like a fancy hair dryer? Uh, it's a very fancy hair dryer. <laughs> it's actually, it's a, it's a heat gun. So just whatever you do to take strip paint off the side of a house. Uh -huh. So that's, that's my favorite, one of my favorite parts about being a pastry chef is I get to go to the hardware store and find cool stuff that right. I can use in the kitchen. Or so. going to buy blow torches for- Going to buy blow torches, yeah. Heat guns, all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> so I think it just got a little overseeded. Okay. It's just sitting there, so we almost I think ready. we'll be. I think it's going to be a little bit better. We're still. Beep. 
We're in the temperature range there, Chef, but it just got a little, okay. just a little overseeded. So well, I think this I is a think perfect time a, to point out that not okay. everything always goes according to plan, no matter how <laughs> long you've been doing this. <laughs> um, so yeah, we all know as pastry chefs and whatnot, a lot of times you have to adapt to what's going on and that's exactly what's happening here, so. Yeah, just needs to, um, just needs a little bit of attention, so. Like me. Like you. Uh, I could probably oversee it a little bit. It's probably, probably fine now. It's just, um, okay. it just got a little bit overseed. It's just a little bit thick. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't want to take the temperature up too much more. I mean, we can go ahead and. It's already at 92, so. Yeah. So I just got it just got a little bit thick. So um is think we can go ahead and use it though? I think we can I think we're gonna be okay to use it. Okay. So. Well I will go ahead and if you uh, know uh, that doesn't cool. work out, well we know that it's because our chocolate was a little bit off, but for the sake of time we'll just go ahead and get right into um, our bonbon making. Now, we're using a 64% um, chocolate for this bonbon, but you could honestly use any type of chocolate. The process would all be the same. Um, this is really for, to show the process rather than you know, working with specific chocolates. Um, but I picked the dark chocolate because dark chocolate and raspberry we know go very well together. Plus, by using the jam as the filling, it's a much sweeter filling, so using the darker chocolate helps for that flavor balance as well. Um, so I've got the chocolate ready, and we'll just do one strip at a time so we can kind of see the process a couple of times. But you just want to, yes, you can tell it's a little bit thicker, but I think for what we're doing, it's going to be okay. But you just want to pipe the chocolate. And it's okay if it's not perfect because that's what the ring cutter is going to be for, so don't worry about that. Um, we have our chocolate. Then you want to take your other strip and you're going to lay it down. And this paper curls a little bit, but that's okay. But you just want to take this and kind of press it down so this flattens out. And you can do this obviously whatever size you want. And then you just want to carefully lift up and of course it's going to pull like that that's okay too because that's again what the ring cutter's for so now we're going to take our jam and we just want to carefully pipe a little in the center and you don't need a lot because if you overfill this it's going to ooze out the sides and it won't seal properly just like when you're making things like filled pastries Um, so we've got that, and now what you're going to do is take this other piece and come back, line it up, and you just want to go around the edge first. It looks like because this uh, acetate is curling a lot, these aren't liking to hold on the edge, but they might. I've got a different, uh, I've got a different sheet over there, Chef, if you want to. We have a different one. Yeah, we might want to use one that's a little bit softer than this type of acetate. Mm -hmm. But we'll see how these work, too. Um, but yeah, I just want to go all the way around, make sure it's sealed. And then we're going to use our ring cutter. And that's a good size right there. And you just want to, yeah, we'll need a softer one because that's not going to hold the shape. It's not going to stay depressed. Scissors, please talk to me. Scissors. 
so is that the yeah, we'll switch to the other acetate because this is this one's too, too sturdy. How wide do you want them, Chef? Um, about like what three inches ish. But we'll still set this aside and see what this does. <laughs> okay. There we go. All right. So yeah, this is the one I used earlier today. So this will be much better. So here we go again. Same process, put our raspberry powder down, let our chocolate go. Piping, making a mess. Okay, same thing, lay this on top. that down. Okay. And you can see by the jam being more of a soft set, it's going to kind of settle into its own little layer. Because if we did something that was stiffer like a pat de fouille or if we used a ganache that was like more of a firm set, we wouldn't be able to press the chocolate around it um, without it starting to poke through the chocolate. So, oh yeah. So we're going around again. Just pressing those to make sure they're sealed. And you don't want to press on the center because that's when you run the risk of your jam pushing out. You want to get as close to it as possible. Yeah, the little jam came out of that one. They're definitely a lot trickier than your traditional type of bonbon but I think they're pretty fun and it gives us a new way to kind of present a filled chocolate and change kind of the idea of what is a bonbon. Let's use our ring cutter. And then obviously we're gonna need to let these <coughs> sit for quite some time to set before we try to um, unmold them so they get that nice shine. Um, these ones are almost there. So we'll do this just one more time real quick. And, and then Chef Zach, I think, is almost ready to cut his jandouille, I believe. Right. I'm, gonna, I'm tending to the chocolate right now. OK. I don't know if y'all heard him, but he's trying to fix our chocolate. So it's possible these bonbons may not look as pretty as they should because of that issue we had with the chocolate, but at least you're able to see this process and practice at home or in your kitchen. I think there's kind of endless possibilities with this. One thing I thought that would be fun to try, although I haven't, is instead of piping <laughs> Um, just one and doing this pressing is what if we were able to actually spread one type of chocolate on one piece of acetate and a different type on another so you actually have two different halves. Um, how that would work and look. Okay. Maybe the third time will be the charm. So 
So again, just going around. All right, we're all sealed. And our last go with the ring cutter. I mean, I kind of like this shape of how it's rough around the edge. Like that might be something fun uh, too. It's all about, you know, your own like artistic take and presentation and what you like to do. Um, so yeah, we'll just let these set and we'll, we'll take them off the acetate here at the end of the class when we unmold the other bonbons and we'll see how our chocolate did. Fingers crossed that it's, <laughs> that it's working out. The process though you saw is exactly, it, you would do that process. Um, hopefully your chocolate did not give you troubles like ours did. Um, but yeah, are we good? Okay. <laughs> um, not quite yet, but we can talk about the chocolate for a few minutes while we're waiting for this. Okay. So uh, what happened with our chocolate really is that um, chocolate, uh, in order to be properly tempered, as you know, uh, forms uh, crystals, right? Yes. So, um, but the crystals are kind of like, they're kind of like bunny rabbits and they like to reproduce quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So what happens is you, you're thinking about tempering chocolate as, temp as temperature, it's really not temperature, it's really uh, pre-crystallizing as you know. Mm -hmm. And so when, um, after it's been sitting there tempered for a while, even though maybe maintaining a proper temperature, those. it just keeps forming those crystals and forming those crystals. So we get something that's overseeded and that's what causes mm -hmm. our chocolate to get really, really thick. So I actually took some chocolate out and I microwaved it to destroy some of those crystals and, and added it back in. Uh, and the trick is not to destroy all of them. Right. When you're doing <laughs> that, uh, that can be a problem. So um, that's what I did in, in um, I think we're, we're a little bit better than what we were. Yeah, from here the texture so looks. We're, we're much better. I think we are still within the temperature range here. So I did turn up the warmer just a little bit to kind of help us. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's just one of those things, chocolate, chocolate, will, chocolate work will keep you humble. Yeah, that's, it's that's, more that's so kind of a fact. It's, it will keep you humble. A lot so. of times I like to tell people, especially when they're like, oh, what do you like being, what do you like about being a pastry chef? And when I'm like, and I do love the scientific side of it. There's a lot of chemistry and physics that go on with what we're doing. Uh, but there is still a level of art and intuition. And what's happening right now with our chocolate is kind of those two things coming together is that, okay, it's at the right temperature. Why isn't it working? It's like, well, just like you said, it's, it's still kind of a matter of that crystallization. And so you need to use your skills and also kind of what your gut's telling you, like, okay, it's over crystallized even though it's the right temperature. So what can we do to fix that? Right. So, I mean, I think that's it kind of, you can't be all one way or all the other when you're doing pastry. You definitely have right. to have a level of both. Yeah, exactly. And then, and then just using, using kind of your knowledge for different things to, um, yeah. to apply that to do, to do different things. Like, you know, our knowledge of tempering chocolate, what can we do with that now? And it's uh, kind of where I'm at with my students right now, too, is that, you know, we've learned all these things. We're getting close to the end of our program and we've learned all these things now. Well, what can you do with all these things? Now? Mm -hmm. So how can you apply these things? How do these things come together? You know, we learned how to make pastry cream. We learned how to make patisse. We learned how to do all these different things. Now, what can you do with it? And if you look on and you know, I tell my students, too, if you look on these the, on Instagram and you see what these these people at, at the, really at the top of their game, the top of their field are doing, uh, and you know, I tell my students like, you know how to do this because you look at what they're doing. Okay, that's patisse. They're just doing it at a higher level. They're doing the exact same things that you know how to do already. They're just doing it at a higher level. So it's that's just, um, and it's just it's inspiring to see that too. So mm -hmm. we talked about kind of seeing this on, on Instagram and saying I I know how to do that. I can do I can I can do that. What can I do with that? And exactly. applying the raspberry to it now. So and that's kind of the the, the fun part of it. So. Yeah. And just like with anything else, this is something that's relatively new to me. So it may not work the first couple of times you do it because it's a new technique and skill you're teaching yourself. So, right. you know, 
and maybe I'm crazy for trying to teach something I just learned in a demo, <laughs> but I think it's pretty fun. And I've also realized that something, it might be new to you and you're like, hey, this is kind of what I'm thinking, but our, our industry and our community is also pretty collaborative too, that we can right. see, well, I see Chef Zach is doing this, like, well, I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna start doing this and whatnot. And we kind yeah. of can end up regrouping and like, we started with this one idea, this one concept or this one ingredient and look at everything that we made just by having multiple people working on it. Right. Right. And that's, I think that's kind of part of what, uh, what we're trying to do with this is that we're trying to, you know, we're showing you a few things with, with these really great products. Like you've, you've got the products in your hands now, what can you do with them? Um, and we're just trying to show you like, here's, here's what we came up with. Yeah. This is what we can do with them. Uh, and get you thinking about, you know, what can I do with this? How can I apply these different things uh, to my situation? And your situation may vary. You could be in a pastry shop, you could be in a restaurant, you could be a hotel, you could be a country club. Uh, you could be baking from home right now. How can I apply this? So like you, you're baking at home right now. Um, so you know, wh where can you apply these different, these different techniques? So our chocolate is better. I'm going to give that a stir. And I'm going to okay. check on my Janduya. How is your chocolate tempering there in your? Uh... Um, well, let's take this first one with the rough acetate. It has started to set, but it's a little more. It's still kind of cloudy just because of we're pulling it too soon. But like I said, because that acetate was much thicker, we ended up not being able to cut all the way through the chocolate. But you can still see that this is kind of the idea. Can you see this? Am I on the right? Is that better? <laughs> um, but it's just really thin. Imagine clean lines and whatnot, and this, would, this is not really snapping. I think there was an issue with the chocolate. But when you break it open, you see you have this like, kind of runny jam in the center, and it's just really thin, a thin layer of chocolate, thin layer a filling so it's almost kind of like I would think a lighter version of what we think of as a bonbon a lot of times bonbons can be like a size that you know one of them might be enough whereas you might be able to have two or three of these because it's a little bit like less chocolate less filling than normal but the size looks actually bigger it looks like you're getting a lot but it's almost like a little taste um, so yeah we'll keep letting the rest of these set hopefully they will come off nice and shiny and have the clean edges. Um, yeah. But if not, we still have something to snack on, right? <laughs> it's almost like uh, my Jandouille is still uh, crystallizing. We're, we're almost there with it, I think. Um, but it's, uh, I put it in the cooler to encourage it mm -hmm. a little bit. So how are you doing with those? Um, they don't appear to have started to separate from the mold just yet. So I don't know if we'll be able to get Get them out just right. Would you like to pop them in the freezer for a few? Yeah, I think if we pop these. Encourage them to contract a yeah, little? Yeah, uh, freeze. Thank you. Yeah, That'll probably help with that. The chocolate has definitely set, but yeah. it's not like, it still seems like it's not quite there. Yeah. So. Yeah. We're just, um. <laughs> we're not quite cool enough to get things to, to crystallize quite as, as quickly as we were hoping for. But right. we're. Um, and that's, if you live in the South, if you're watching this and you live in the South, especially here in New Orleans where we live in a bowl, we are below sea level, so the humidity and heat is even worse. <laughs> Why did we choose to live here? Um, but it makes doing this type of work a little bit more difficult, so that's why if you see any place that's down here that is doing things like bonbons and chocolate work um, and sugar work, pretty much nobody does sugar work here <laughs> because of these issues. Nope. <laughs> but if you... But if you do see that and they're doing them well, that means they, they know what they're doing and they've been able to overcome um, these types of issues. So. They spend a lot of money on air conditioning. Or they spend a lot of money on air conditioning. That could be it too. <laughs> so I'm still so, waiting on mine, so. Um, still waiting, still wait. Uh, so how are we doing with that? I mean, we can peel one of these other ones. Like my guess is it just, even though it was over crystallized, it wasn't, it's yeah. kind of lost its temper, yeah. <laughs> pun. <laughs> um, but the concept is there and the process was there, so at least we got to see that. So also, I mean, we're pulling them off so early too. Yeah, They're normally not gonna... you would let these set for yeah. hours. Yeah. You want to set would... those overnight, but you did have some that you brought in. Did you have some that you want to show? I do have some that I brought in and they're also not perfect, but they do have the edge to them. Um, because I have the same kind of issues at home with my <laughs> air conditioning and whatnot. But you can see that like, so for the back side, wait, can we, I don't know, I hope you can see that. <laughs> um, but you see how 
by able to cut through them, you end up with this nice round uh, shape, but you have this really thin, and you can see on this side where the raspberry powder is in it. I don't know if you can see it, but you kind of have like these little depressions. It's got some texture to it as well as the powder. And so when you eat this, and it's not melting in my hand, so that means I tempered it right. Um, so you're gonna get, there we go. You're gonna have the jam that kind of comes out. I hope you can see it. <laughs> Um, with that snap, but then that raspberry powder also is going to help intensify that flavor. And because there's no sugar in the raspberry powder, it sort of takes out, or it kind of cuts back on that sweetness too, which is really nice. Um, so we can snack on this. We have lots of snacks today. <sighs> um. I guess what the last thing is you need to cut and, and, yep. and we're just dip. a few minutes away uh, from that still and same so thing I'm just sure one of those, those things I'm sure those ruby bonbons in the freezer will be able to pop out mm -hmm. so hopefully and, I, and I fired up my my impatience machine so, uh, my blast chiller so that'll get it going even sooner so okay cool now generally you don't want to force it to crystallize uh, sooner but you know, you're dealing with certain environments like, like we all know. Not, I mean, unless you have a chocolate shop, very yeah. rarely do you have a perfect environment for doing this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So um, you kind of learn little tricks. Uh, you don't want to push something too hard as far as, you know, chilling it and getting to crystallize too quickly. Right, but you, you also don't them. want to, um, you know, you, if you don't go quick enough, you'll have, uh, you'll have problems as well. So um, okay. almost there. Almost there. I promise. So. Um, <laughs> the contraption in front of me, which we'll pan down and talk about in a minute, uh, which some of you may recognize it's a, it's a guitar cutter. I actually have a very small one compared to what most people will see. Um, so I, I affectionately call it my ukulele. It's a smaller guitar, which, yeah. You're a dad. I'm dad sure. jo I'm a dad. Yeah. At, uh, yeah. I'm a dad at, I'm a dad at heart. I'm, <laughs> I'm good with the, the dad jokes. So, so. We're just about there. Let me check the chocolate. Uh, Zach, have you put the raspberry powder in a chocolate, directly into the chocolate before? Um, I have, not this particular one, but I, I have, and actually because the chocolate kind of helps seals and, and protects it, it's, it does, um, and I don't think, you know, the, the color of this is gonna fade anytime soon, but it does seem to protect it a little bit. And it's a great way to add um, color too to something. If you did this with white chocolate, mm -hmm. uh, or even the ruby chocolate, so the color, uh, kind of shown through a little bit more than this. Uh, this is, it's pretty, but it's a little bit more subtle. Um, yeah. You can do, and you, if, actually if you do chocolate decor, you spread it on, you temp, just sift it over like what you did, and you kind of smear the white chocolate kind of back and forth. It actually kind of forms almost like a marbled effect to it with, uh, with the powder. Uh, and then it's, so it's colored, but it's also flavored at the same time, which I yeah. like, because sometimes, you know, using color for the sake of color is, I try and steer clear of it sometimes. Yeah. But, all right, so we have encouraged this, I think, to the point where we're going to be ready to go. So awesome. We're going to, I'm just going to use my, uh, actually, let me do this first. I'll get it out of the frame first. So I'm going to. Invert. Okay. Well, would you look at that? Go and then this is just going to pop for the most part. Pop right out. Actually, give me a small offset spatula. I'm just going to go around with a small offset spatula or a paring knife next drawer up. That's fine. I'll usually use a spatula for this because I don't want to risk kind of cutting up my frames or anything like that. So there we go. Thank you. That will encourage that to come off.
And we'll just keep flipping it around. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to place this on my, my peel for this. And it's pretty stable, so I'm actually, at this point, it's crystallized fairly well. Yeah. And I'll go through the, the pat de fouille first. So I'll place this onto my guitar. I have my fancy spatula here, so I'm just going to use that. And I want to make sure I'm going to get the best yield I can out of this. And I don't find with the, the Jean Dieu, there's a need to put a chablon on it. Um, you can, and just with the frame, slowly right through. Now, you don't want the Jean Dieu to set as firm as it will, because this will make this process much more difficult. I'm trying to do this without banging it right through. There we go. And I'll come after it from the corner. So you can see the Jean Dieu, just, it, you don't need to put a chablon on it, I, I don't find. Uh, it's necessary because it, um, you know, it, it is fairly stable. And a chablon is just, you know, a layer of chocolate if you're unfamiliar. So, uh, very thin layer of, of tempered chocolate on here. So, I can put this back on. Now, if I wanted to stop at this point, kind of cut them in half, I can make candy bars, which wouldn't be a bad thing. Let's see if I can get just a little bit more out of that. Cool. I think we can get right up to the edge on that one. And down we go. A little bit too much pressure. But uh, as you can see now, I'm trying to hold that up so you can see, we have two layers. Uh, we have our, our peanut butter and jelly. So from here, I can transfer this onto my sheet tray. I keep forgetting I've got my sp fancy spatula for that right there. Mm -hmm. Get this out of the way. And kind of clean up a little bit. And kind of shift gears a little bit. And normally I would come over here and I would separate these out a little bit more, but I'll separate them as we go through. I was looking for. So now, I can come back to my chocolate. I think we're much better off than we were. So let me get some gloves on real quick. And we're just going to dip. Now, obviously, if you have an enrubbing machine, <laughs> which would be nice to have, but they're also very expensive. So this would be nice if you could do you know, for VIP, because it's obviously going to be a bit of labor involved uh, dipping these. And I'd like, because the, the raspberry is going to be softer, it's going to, you want that towards the top. So as I'm going to dip this, I'm going to place the Gianduya down. I'm going to go in with my fork. I'm going to bounce it into the chocolate and right onto our tray. And I like to kind of, before it sets down, push it forward a little bit. Sometimes you get a little bit of a foot. And then you can do a little decorative bit like that with your, with your dipping fork. Um, another thing you can do if you've got some of the raspberry powder before the chocolate sets, you can sprinkle raspberry powder on it. You can sprinkle a few of the fragments on there as well. So, and for me, when I'm dipping, I want to make sure I have a full bowl of chocolate. It's going to make your life a lot easier. 
It's just sticking to my fork a little bit. So now, I, normally, I'd want to let this, the, the Jandouille crystallize a little bit longer. It's not going to stick to your fork quite as much, but just to give us a good idea of what we're doing here, what we're having. Otherwise, you can see it is sticking to my fork just a little bit. Um, actually, this one's getting a little bit better, so I can tell it is starting to crystallize. You can leave it plain. If you have the fragments, you could put a few of the fragments on top. That would look really pretty. You want to kind of hint, for me, I like to hint kind of what's on the inside. Same thing if you're doing uh, a cake. So, see, hand dipping, obviously not something you'll see a lot anymore. Mm -hmm. Like I said, this is sticking to my, um, my fork just a little bit yet. But if we waited another hour, which you guys probably don't have, <laughs> um, it would crystallize a little bit more and just make it a little bit, a little bit easier to handle. So, or like I said, this is, you know, this is shelf stable as is. So you can leave this sitting at room temperature, it would be fine. The pat de -pee would probably dry out at some point. It does start to shrink after a little while, after. Yeah, I mean, just you know, moisture it, loss and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. But if you keep it in an airtight container, it doesn't do that as much. Yeah, so if you wrap this really well, this would, it would do that. So chocolate's a little bit better. It's still a little bit overseeded, so it's a little bit thick, but I'm not getting, it's not pillow topping on me too much. So I had a little, a little rough spot there. So. I've actually done a, a similar bonbon um, like this, but it was, it was the peanut butter, but I did a peanut butter ganache, a jandouille would have been much nicer, knowing that now, um, with strawberry pat de fouille, um, and then I dipped that in the ruby chocolate, because that, that those, nice. those flavor profiles were really, really nice together too. All right, so uh, we kind of get the idea, I can go, I can keep doing this for a while, and obviously I have to, <laughs> to get them all done, but uh, the chocolate I think is, is fine, just a little bit overseeded at this point, so I'm gonna, Mm -hmm. Flash it again in the, in the microwave. Uh, microwave is not a four little word in pastry. We still, we still love our microwave. So I'm going to pass this back over to you. How's, are they starting to release? Yep, so release? we popped these bonbons into the freezer and they've definitely all mostly released from the mold. So we some parchment here? Yes. So we should be able to just look at that. I always end up smashing at least one of them when I do this because one falls out. Always. With, Is that always I'm, the way it goes? As right? I'm about to tap it. Ooh, look at that shine. Very nice. See, sometimes you just need time. Yes. But sometimes that's not okay, the thing. Okay, look at that. Didn't smash one, Chef. I didn't smash a single one, and they all came out. Obviously, we didn't um, put any cocoa butter, any type of decorative type of garnish or anything on this. We thought about doing the raspberry powder in the mold, but I was worried it was all just going to settle to the bottom and it just wouldn't look nice. Plus, like we saw with those, it kind of, you leave that texture on the outside and we want a nice, like, smooth uh, shine to it. Yes. But you can see how nice that is. And do we want to cut one in half? Yeah. Wanna let's cut one. Let's cut one in half. Paring knife. Get a little paring knife. I do. There we go. The time for the big reveal. Yes. So I could have gone a little thinner on my top shelf, but for the most part, you can see, can we see that? Yeah. So you have that nice color for that ganache in the center and then the pink for the ruby on the outside. Um, and I imagine too, this is something like Chef Zach was saying with the other ones that you could take those raspberry fragments, either the dehydrated, probably the dehydrated ones, not the frozen ones, and fold that into the ganache and then fill them. You could, I mean, I mean, yeah, I would do that. Yeah, yeah. you could do that. Um, the the fragment, the dehydrated ones would probably soften, would soften for sure in the ganache. Mm -hmm. But you wouldn't have to worry about preservation at that point, which is really exactly. kind of what a I'd lot of this is about. So, so we can have a little plate. We can kind of show off a little bit. Mm -hmm. Anyway, kind of what we've done. A few things here and there. So how are we laying this out? However you want. Jeff. We're gonna have some fun. Here with we can it. do two rows of the. Yeah. And just kind of go a little random. Yeah. I should have put more raspberry powder on those because that, that looks really pretty. But I've got more to do. I'll dip yeah. some more. So uh, you can see, I'll try and get this up to where you guys can see, uh, some of our handiwork here. 
So some really um, some great ideas to to use uh, with some of the products. Uh, you know, most of right now we use the the puree and uh, the dehydrated. Uh, I didn't mention anything when I was making my pack to flea, but if you wanted to, I think I did. You wanted to substitute some of the whole and broken in there and kind of get a little bit more pulp in there, or even they offer a puree with with seeds. And I did talk about that too. Just, it's you know kind of personal preference. It kind of depends on what you want to what you want to do with it. So. Um, at this point, um, Chef, do you have anything you want to add? Or? Um, no, I think we've covered everything. I'm sorry if we went a little over. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm sorry that these ones didn't really work out that great. Um, but I think it was just that issue out of the chocolate. But I actually, I don't know, I kind of like, imagine this being tempered properly, but <laughs> that shape that's on there, I think that's a really fun way to say, oh, hey, this is a bonbon. Mm. It's like, it might kind of like these came out a little bit throw, throw people for mm. a loop, you know? You know, break break it up, and we can see the inside. Mm -hmm. We'll just cut this one. Yeah, that'll give you a better idea, though, how it's just really thin layer of chocolate and a really thin layer of jam. Is that? Yeah. So, I imagine with with the moisture and the jam, it probably probably your shelf life on this probably isn't too long. Yeah, it's probably it a little to, shorter. Yeah, uh, interfere with the chocolate, but. Mm -hmm. um, Guys, that's all, that's all we have to share for you today. Thank you. Bye, everyone.